This is Jesus speaking, um, one of his parables. <coughs> For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you too go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour, and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, You too go into the vineyard. And when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. And when those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more. And they also received, each one, a denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what's yours and go your way. But I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? Thus the last shall be first, and the first last. Let's pray together as we come to the word. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your holy word. May it be a light to our path, and food for hungry people. And now we pray again for your Holy Spirit to be our teacher, to lead us into truth. And Lord, may we receive it with gladness. And may your word produce in us obedience to your will and your way. A life that will bring glory to your name. And all of this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. <coughs> Amen. Amen. I read some time ago about a million dollar golf tournament in America. Um, it was held a few years back and it drew contestants from all over the world, from near and far. And many, many pro experienced professional golfers who'd worked for years and years on their game. They came to have their shot at the jackpot. The winner would be the one who got closest to the pin. And golfer after golfer tried for the hole. And one skilled veteran made it within six inches, which is pretty good. 
And then he watched as a total amateur hacker came to the tee and swung his club in the most horrible looking swing he'd ever seen. <laughs> but luck was with this amateur. His ball bounced off a nearby photographer's cart <laughs> and landed just one inch from the hole. So he won the contest. He won the million dollar jackpot. That is when the recriminations began. I mean, you have heard the expression sour grapes, haven't you? Negativity, blame, and anger when things didn't turn out the way that you expected. Most typically, it is when a political party loses in an election. And after the result is announced, the losing party claims that the polls were rigged. There were irregularities. There was intimidation. Opposition voters were prevented from voting. It wasn't a level playing field. I'm, I'm speaking from an African background, do you understand? Where this sort of thing happens virtually every election in virtually any country in Africa. And very often, the claims may well have a lot of truth to them. It's, it's happened on countless occasions. And the results have been very predictable. The reactions have been also very predictable. Now, this parable, which we're looking at this morning, describes exactly this kind of response, this grumbling, sour grapes attitude. And coincidentally enough, is actually a story about people who work where grapes are grown. And you just heard the reading, and so you've already got the flavor of, of the situation. And um, they were producing wine of a different sort. But um, it's a parable that has given rise to a whole lot of different interpretations about what Jesus is getting at here. It seems to be all about unemployment and work and wages, management and workers. And not surprisingly, people have picked up on various bits of it in the belief that Jesus is giving a kind of coded message about socialism or capitalism and the economic philosophies that underpin our society. And it's a parable which I'm quite sure uh, many workers in blue, people in blue collar jobs, and will find particular things which they can identify with. Um, no doubt um, today's trade union spokesmen would align themselves very much with the man at the end of the parable who speaks up for workers and talks about wage differential, saying that it's quite unfair that those who worked all day get the same wage as those who've only worked for an hour or so at the end of the day. And it would be quite easy to argue that Jesus is telling a socialist story in which he's highlighting the two basic rights of the worker the right to work and the right to a living wage. And there it is, that's socialism. Jesus must have been a socialist. And you can point to the fact that, as well, that the owner of the vineyard was giving everybody a job and was worried about unemployment. He wasn't concerned as to whether he made a profit 
or whether it would um, pay him to give these men a job. He was only concerned that the men should have a job and that they should have enough money to take home at the end of the day. Um, therefore, he believed in the minimum wage. A denarius was just about adequate as a minimum wage in those days. So there's these strong socialist overtones to this parable. But equally well, you could put yourself in the position of the business executive or the company director and say, no, 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 Jesus is describing a capitalist system here. And the owner of the vineyard can hire and fire at will. He has no trade union breathing down his neck. He decides the wages, not the workers. There are no arbitration authorities. There are no appeals, no industrial tribunals. This is free enterprise, isn't it? Here's the evidence that Jesus was a capitalist. Now, of course, in either of those two cases, those arguments are based on just taking a little bit of the story and being selective in what you like. And if you play around with the Bible like that, of course you can prove anything you like. You can prove that Jesus was anything from a communist to a capitalist. But the proper way to take the Bible is to take the whole of it. You can't just pick and choose the bits that you like. We have to take this parable in its entirety, or not at all. But when you do take it as a whole, it's still quite a puzzling story. Most, most of the story describes <coughs> ordinary everyday life at the time. Picture the scene, if you will. It's six o'clock in the morning at the Chateau Bethlehem Berg vineyards. The AD 33 vintage needs to be picked. And the landowner goes out to hire some casual people to do the work. <coughs> so we've got a lot of unemployed people hanging around the job center. <coughs> There's a foreman who is looking for casual workers, people looking for work. The man hiring a number of them um, at various times throughout the day. And then at the end of the day, the owner pays them all. There's nothing particularly extraordinary so far. But now, something unusual happens. There comes an extraordinary twist to the story, which seems utterly bizarre, and even unrealistic. And it's at that point that the story is illustrating the kingdom of heaven. Because if you notice in verse 1, it begins, Jesus begins by saying, For the kingdom of heaven is like this. And the whole story turns upside down at that point. It's the point when the wages are paid. And the owner says, send the people who came first to the back of the queue for their wages. Now, a man who does that is really rather silly. I mean, can you imagine doing that in an employment situation today? 
that people who started work at 6 in the morning should get to the back of the queue at 5 in the afternoon and let those who had only started work an hour earlier get their wages first. There's something already happening that's a bit out of the ordinary that somehow doesn't fit. And so it's at this point that Jesus is highlighting an aspect of the kingdom of heaven. And then secondly, when these workers open their wage packets, here's the next shock. They had all got the same. And they now realise why the owner of the vineyard put the early workers to the back of the queue. So they could see what the latecomers got in their pay packets. Why didn't he take the early workers first, pay them off, let them find that they've got their agreed daily wage, and get them out of sight before you pay the latecomers? If, if he wanted to be generous, why not do it that way? Because he wanted everyone to see what he did. Now you'd think on earth, <coughs> surely this owner is just provoking human nature. It is incredibly insensitive <coughs> in terms of personnel management. That kind of approach to work and wages would be a disaster in any situation here on earth. I mean, just think what would happen in today's world. There would be a walkout straight away. At the very least, the National Union of Vine Dressers would have everybody out on strike. All trust and good relationships would be wrecked in just one day. I mean, if you can just use your imagination for a moment, what do you think would happen the following day when the owner goes out to hire casual workers? Have you thought about that? He sends the foreman down to the job centre, as he did the day before, at six in the morning, nobody there. So the foreman tries again at ten o'clock, nobody there. Tries at noon, nobody there. Goes back at five o'clock in the afternoon, and there's a long queue. <laughs> I mean, you put yourself into this situation, this kind of situation today. Imagine <coughs> that you've worked all week, and then on Friday afternoon, the boss has taken on someone else, and then you find that that person gets exactly the same wages as you get. I know exactly how you will feel. You will say, oh, that is so wonderful, I'm so thrilled for you. <laughs> I had to work a whole week for that. But you've only worked one afternoon. You are so lucky. Let's go out and celebrate and have a drink together. That's how you would feel, wouldn't it? <laughs> no? <coughs> well, what's gone wrong? Wouldn't you be excited for them? No. Why not? Because of human nature. I mean, have you noticed, little children, there is one regular phrase which they all use, which you never have to teach them, and it comes right out of their own hearts. 
And it's this. It's not fair. <laughs> Did your children say that? During my childhood, my brother and I used to spend every available hour of daylight playing cricket in the back garden. And unlike today, when you happen to be playing for the ashes, with my brother and I, there was no decision review system. There was no hotspot. There was no snicko. There was no third umpire and no slow motion replays. And almost invariably the game would end sooner or later by one or other of us stomping off and saying it's not fair, he's out. <laughs> Every child I know uses that phrase. Isn't that so? But I'll guarantee there isn't a parent here amongst us who taught their child to use that phrase. It's one of the most instinctive features of human nature. And you see it not only in children, you see it right the way through life. It's usually a very self-centered attitude because you are usually protesting in terms of how it affects you. But I think maybe the worst feature of saying it's not fair is this. If you are treated fairly and you get all that you deserve, if someone else gets more than they deserve, you feel resentful. Now that's really what's at the root of this story. It is a horrible feature of human nature. If I get all I deserve but my pal gets more than he deserves, then I hate him. That's human nature. And that's what was happening in this story. Now this is where this parable gets very personal to each one of us. Because your reaction to the vineyard owner as the employer in this story will either be that the owner was less than fair or the owner was more than fair. And every one of us has to decide which one you think it is. This is the point that Jesus wants you to consider. The men who worked first agreed to work for a whole day for a whole day's wage. They got all that they agreed to, all that they deserved. Everything was absolutely just and fair. So why were they so angry? Because others got more than they deserved. That's all. It wasn't that they had been treated unfairly. It was that somebody else had got more. <coughs> that employer was not less than fair. He was absolutely fair, but more than fair. And here's the extraordinary twist in Jesus' parable. Why does the vineyard owner do this? It is because there is a truth here about the kingdom of heaven. This isn't earth. It doesn't work on earth. But there's a different approach in the kingdom of heaven. You see, if you're not careful, if you live in the kingdom of earth, you talk 
about the rights of the workers. And you'll say that the boss <coughs> was less than fair. If you live in the kingdom of heaven, you'll talk about the mercies of the owner. And you'll say that he was more than fair. That's the big question. Was he less than fair or more than fair? Because the bottom line is this, that it actually isn't a story about justice. It's a story about mercy. I heard of a lady who once went into a photographer's studio and uh, she said in a very dignified voice to the photographer, she said, young man, I want some photographs doing, I want you to do me justice. And uh, the photographer looked her up and down for a moment and he said, madam, it's not justice but mercy that you need. <laughs> That is the point of this parable. Everything in the kingdom of heaven is a mercy. I am just so glad that the kingdom of heaven is not a meritocracy. It doesn't even begin with what you deserve. It begins with sheer mercy. That vineyard owner was perfectly within his rights to show mercy where he wanted to show mercy. That is the way it is with God. If I've got good health, then praise God. It's a mercy. If I'm sick, I have no right to say to God, it's not fair, he's healthy and I'm not. No, but if God gives me health today, it's sheer mercy. Everything is a mercy to somebody who's living in the kingdom of heaven. Because you realize that God operates not on what a person deserves to get, but on what He, the Lord, likes to give. I'm getting bombarded by a, a spider. We live in a society and a culture that is based on M-E-R-I-T, merit. And we believe we should have everything we want and that we should fight for our rights. Rights has become the in word. But the kingdom of heaven operates on M-E-R-C-Y, mercy. And one of the most challenging missionary books that you could read, um, and everybody who's actually not going to be a missionary should read it, it's a very old-fashioned um, book now from the 1950s, written by a missionary, it's called Have We No Rights? And it's, this missionary is saying, have we no right to a home of our own? Have we no right to the furniture which we would like to choose? Have we no right to live in a nice area of our choice? Have we no right to a decent income? And the answer is no. In relation to God, a Christian has no rights at all. How can I shout and protest and stand on my rights in the light of the one who was spread-eagled on a cross, having laid down every one of his rights in order to save me? We are recipients of mercy.
not demanders of rights. And the kingdom of heaven operates on the grounds of mercy, never on the grounds of merit. Now, I want to say at this point that mercy and justice are not opposites. Don't make that misunderstanding. They are not against each other. They actually travel the same road. The only difference is that justice goes so far and mercy goes further. Justice will give you what you deserve. Mercy will go further and give you what you never deserved. Do you see the difference? So in the kingdom of heaven, it is not justice or mercy, because God is both just and merciful. He will give everybody what they deserve, which as far as I'm concerned is pretty frightening. If God simply deals with us on the basis of justice, we would all end up in hell, because none of us comes close to satisfying God's requirements for a perfect life. But his mercy goes further than his justice, and gives people what they never deserve. And the second thing is this. Mercy is at the disposal of the one who exercises it. We have no right to mercy. We may have a right to justice, but nobody has a right to mercy. And as the Bible says in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. But his mercy is not arbitrary. It's not a lottery. It's not simply a matter of luck. Not that God just picks your particular name out of a hat in order to extend mercy to you. You have to ask for it. And when you pray and ask for God's mercy, that is a prayer that he will never ignore. But you have to realize that you need it. And I believe I'm speaking to people this morning who need God's mercy. But I guarantee that as long as you batter the gates of heaven with your rights and say, I have a right to health, I have a right to forgiveness, I have a right to blessing, I have a right to happiness, you will find those gates remain barred and shut. And you'll go through life saying it's not fair. Not fair. Because the essence of the Christian gospel is this, quite simply. God dispenses gifts, <coughs> not wages. None of us gets to heaven based on merit. But the amazing thing is, as soon as you come and you say, God, I appeal to your mercy. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Then you find the gates of heaven will swing wide open. Is that a prayer that echoes with your heart today? Are you prepared to say quite simply, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I deserve nothing. 
to thank you that Jesus died for me on the cross. I trust in his saving blood. And I welcome the Holy Spirit in gratitude for your mercy. I give you my life. Can you say that from your heart today? Because a day will come when it will be too late. When you stand before Christ on Judgment Day, the opportunity for receiving God's mercy will be passed. And I quite often meet people, even religious people or church people, who have never really asked God to be merciful to them. Because they've never been that desperate. They've never thought they were bad enough to warrant it. They thought they were actually quite good. And that God should have plenty enough reason to bless them. But I sense this morning, it's more likely that for many of us who are here today, there could have been times, there can be times, when you look back and you, once you knew that mercy well, and you were so grateful to God, you'd have done anything to express your thanks. But sometimes, you know, it happens, doesn't it? That awareness can fade. Because it is so easy to get indoctrinated and infected with the mindset of our society. Where our culture tells us that standing on our rights is what is most important. To the point whereby we begin to take God a bit for granted. And the challenge of Jesus in this parable is to get back into that stream of mercy. You know, in the Old Testament, and at the very heart of the tabernacle of Moses was a golden piece of furniture which represented God's presence. It had the carved seraphim above it. It had the Ten Commandments inside the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of that was a slab of gold, which was called the Mercy Seat. The Mercy Seat. It was just a poor representation of the real thing. But it was accurate. At the heart of Father God is a mercy seat where people can come and sit who have no claims to demand and no rights whatever before him. And the cross is the place where God's justice and God's mercy meet. Tis mercy all, immense and free. And oh my God, it found out me. My prayer is that that will be true for someone listening to my voice today. Let's pray. Righteous Father, you are so merciful. And we confess that we're so prone to take advantage of that. We forget that every act of forgiveness cost the blood of your Son. It cost you so much. 
Lord, I pray that you'd speak to each one of us personally. Lord, we're all sinful people. There's not one of us who deserves anything at all from you. We have no rights whatsoever. But we can ask you for mercy. Please grant us what we can never deserve. But in your grace, we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.